So I'm still talking about 3D printing. Um, and let me go off script for just a second in light of the plenary session. Uh, so anytime you title a, a paper about weakening patents, you get labeled as an IP minimalist uh, if nobody listens to anything other than the title. Um, and I'm, I'm working on, on a, doing a book for this and, and got some feedback to the same extent. But I'm actually not an IP minimalist. My, my intuition is towards uh, stronger patents or, or strong, clear patents, that sort of thing. But I still uh, don't think that patent law or IP law is religion. Um, and so I put the incentive theory to the test in this paper. This came about with my co-author, Dr. Joshua Pierce, who's an um, engineering 3D printing uh, professor uh, and plays with 3D printers all day long. He wanted to abolish patents. Uh, today, right now, and I said, I can't write that with you, and so this was sort of, uh, you know, where can we meet in the middle? Uh, so that's kind of what happened here. Um, and if you think about this idea of problematic patents, and so what one of the, the big picture uh, of this paper is, if you took a snapshot of all the patents 50 years ago, those things that were listed on, on Harry and Will's far left there as problematic, they didn't appear in the patent uh, they weren't patents. There were no software patents, or very few, and there were very few uh, business problems, no business method patents 50 years ago. And so what has happened is now we've opened up new technologies, as we should, uh, as they come about, and we may ask, in, in essence, has something about the, the sum total of all patents, do, it does now the patent system need to be adjusted in light of all the types of patents that are out there? That's kind of what uh, we're getting at in this uh, paper. So. The police are coming to get me. <laughs> uh, we all know there's all these different reasons for the patent system, and we're going to focus exclusively on these two incentive to invent. It's a commercialized. We'll lump them all together as incentive to innovate. And then what we do is we say, OK, the idea uh, of patents uh, is in part that these innovation entails a bunch of costs and risks, and then patents provide these incentives to engage in those uh, for the whole innovation cycle. Uh, and, and we don't get into the static and dynamic and all of that, but basically you have research, inventing, investors, product development, um, marketing, and uh, distribution. And our uh, approach is to say that technology is lowering all of these costs and risks, and are we at some sort of point where it makes sense to question, uh, to weaken patents, not to abolish them necessarily, but in light of these lower costs and risks, Maybe we should weaken patents. Um, we look at various newer technologies, even though the internet doesn't feel new. It, it, you know, I remember dialing up on a modem uh, once upon a time. So uh, we talk about cloud computing, but really we talk about 3D printing. That's his expertise. That's been my research interest for the past year or so. Uh, and that's the main thrust of this. And we acknowledge that as a limitation. And there's a little bit, we could say, in the Kim Bio area, but, but that's certainly not our uh, expertise, but I cherry pick a good chart. So um, I don't think I have to convince you that internet and computers have lowered a lot of costs uh, in terms of uh, research, invention, collaboration, that sort of thing. Uh, and in marketing and distribution, it's a lot easier to beam a software product to you than it is to package up the box and mail it to a big box store. Um, and we talk a little bit about, again, cloud computing and biotech advances. Here's my one snapshot of my favorite biotech uh, type slide is the, the cost of DNA sequencing. And again, compared to Moore's Law, the white line is Moore's Law, which is a very impressive uh, de uh, decrease in the cost and increase in the speed of, of processors and memory and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and it sort of tracks along, and I don't even know why this is the case, what technological things <coughs> happen to. But now we have 23andMe, and we all just go out and find our DNA for you know, $20, or whatever the case is. So, uh, yes, biopharma still is very expensive for lots of reasons, and we don't, uh, don't hide from that fact. Um, we talk about 3D printing quite a lot, though, and we walk through uh, all the invention, all the innovation cycle that I listed before, but uh, here we'll just talk about one, the first one, uh, for time purposes, uh, is the basic research. And one of the things my co-author does is he um, creates basic research tools in the 3D CAD environment and then sends them around to uh, other universities, high schools, et cetera, to 3D print these basic research tools. 
at a tenth to a twentieth of the cost that you would buy them at retail. Uh, so he makes his own centrifuges for $50 instead of $500, his own orbital shaker for $200 instead of $2,000, his own filter wheel, which is something the only white experiments for $50 instead of $2,500. Um, and shares these immediately around the internet, internet, collaborates with other researchers to improve them. So very impressive. And we can go through uh, the idea of prototyping, obviously, with three-dimensional printing. Uh, if we can get to a point where 3D printing is ubiquitous, we no longer ship goods to you. We beam the CAD file to you. You print it at home or at a, your neighborhood, sort of Kinko's, as it were. So dramatically changing uh, the way that we even do the distribution of physical goods. So, we look at this and say, when this technology is mature, what 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 will that mean for the patent system? So, there's plenty of caveats. 3D printing, this, we don't print out very many things at home other than little plastic Lego pieces and that sort of thing right now. Um, we don't know how technology will progress. Will we be printing iPhones while we're still alive? You know, someday that would be great. Um, but we don't know that. And uh, the technology effects are uneven across sectors. So um, biotech pharma may have uh, much, much still, still much higher costs uh, than uh, other areas. So uh, what we say is, is what are currently cheaper, sort of going along Harry slides, software, computer type uh, software, sorry, internet companies, those things have been, uh, become much cheaper to produce. Got an anecdote from one inventor who started an uh, internet based company in 1999. Took him $5 million in six months. He had servers in his garage and that sort of thing. And he started up a similar internet company in 2013 for $50,000 and he did it in three weeks. Uh, so that's cheaper than $50,000 is the kind of money you can raise from friends and family and online uh, uh, funding and that sort of thing. Uh, software RIP. Uh, and then what we would move into the category of cheap now with three-dimensional printing would be a lot of mechanical devices, right? As 3D printing matures, that uh, will be much cheaper to uh, produce and invent and that sort of thing. And perhaps maybe electromechanical devices, electronic devices, as printable electronics become uh, the norm. Uh, uncertain that it would be cheaper in the future for regulatory as well as other reasons. Uh, all of the chemical, pharma, that sort of thing. So, recognizing those co uh, caveats, let's talk about our, our overall uh, story in patent law is that we need to recoup large costs of R&D and we have various incentives, lead time advantage, brand name establishment, patents, and, and others. Uh, and we ask if we are going to lower the costs and risks of <coughs> innovation, then uh, we need to lower uh, these other incentives to match them, assuming they match now, then we would need to lower them to match in this new, cheaper innovation world. And there's, of course, another story is that the same technology makes it really easy and cheap and fast to copy people's inventions. Therefore, I don't I think at all we should do away with patents because uh, you can copy them, uh, you can copy inventions very easily, very cheaply, very quickly. Um, so it turns out you do have shrinking lead time. You do have a reduced chance to uh, develop brand names before you have competitors. Um, but what about patents, right? The patents uh, are not, have not shrunk. What do we need to do if we should uh, weaken patents? Uh, we probably should do it gradually as this technology matures. And so we look at ways uh, to do this. We look at first, maybe an obvious way to do it is to shorten the patent term from 15 years to 20 years. Uh, something we say dramatic enough to be noticeable, to measure the effects of the change. So we, we just uh, come around a number about 25 to 50 percent. Shorten the patent term. That has various problems. It uh, violates trips. Uh, there will be huge industry opposition. Congress doesn't like to do much of anything. Um, and it's a very blunt instrument, unless we carved out, for instance, biotech, pharma, that sort of thing. So we coalesce around what we think is a better uh, idea to increase maintenance fees. We've seen uh, discussion about this in other contexts. Uh, David Olson talks about it in the context of patent trolls, and others have talked about it. Uh, so you've jacked up basically the 12 year maintenance fee. Uh, maybe you multiply it by 100 or something to that effect, and you would in essence, 
uh, shorten patents by about 25% if you did that. Um, you would have less industry opposition by Big Pharma. They have less patents per product. They buy the 12-year maintenance fee. Know if they have a blockbuster drug, they'd be happy to pay the $500,000 maintenance fee for that 12-year fee for the products that they are making a ton of money off of. Uh, they, they, so they might uh, oppose it less anyway than they would just simply shortening the patent term. Um, you have uh, benefits of cleaning up all these just marginal patents that we uh, maybe that fall in the middle of Harry and Will's uh, scale there. And short term especially, uh, you'd have some beneficial effects against patent trolls. Um, still obviously have opposition. We would need to think about how to protect individual inventors perhaps. That's, that's comments we've gotten. Uh, you can reduce their maintenance fee to some sort of micro-entity status as well. And we'd have to look at the unintended consequences of the patent office, kind of getting in Keith's presentation a little bit. Uh, uh, Fritz and Wasserman talk about these different uh, internal incentives for the patent office. They don't want their maintenance fees going away. That pays for half of their bills. Uh, so there would be some interesting dynamics there. <coughs> uh, what we do then is, is look at some other ways that uh, we can analyze this uh, weakening of patents. We look at non-monetary incentives. We look at, ask the question about global competitiveness. And um, then we analyze it briefly, uh, which could be another paper on, on sort of technology-specific needs. So uh, we make a point in the paper that uh, there are obviously non-monetary incentives to engage in that literature, many of which uh, in here have done. And uh, imagine a world where, this is completely made up, but 50% of your motivation comes from non-patent incentives to invent, and 50% comes from uh, patent incentives. If that were true, our point is simply that if you weaken patents by 25% or 50%, that doesn't mean you've weakened overall incentives by the same amount, because if you lop 50% uh, off of the patent strength, you've only lopped 25% off of the overall monetary, uh, overall incentive to innovate. Um, and that, that's just one of the points we make. Uh, there's questions about global competitiveness. Well, if we weaken U.S. patents and nobody else did, then would companies just run from the United States and go elsewhere? I think you would have a good argument, perhaps, if we abolished patents, that that would happen, but not as much uh, if you simply weaken them in the way that we talk about, there's plenty of reasons why companies choose to uh, be in the United States or have a presence in the United States, only one of which may be the patent system. We would still be a very rich, huge market for sales, and you would still have a patent. Uh, then we cite to Will Hubbard, uh, who says, you know, wait a minute, you know, as we weaken patents, actually that may make us more globally competitive. The idea being, Patents can sometimes make you fat and lazy, right? You sit there behind a 20-year exclusivity, and you don't do what the prospect theory says. You instead just uh, make as much money as you can and sit around. Uh, and to the extent that is uh, ever true, then you're not uh, being sort of physically fit as a company. You're getting fat and lazy. And if we have shorter patent terms or weaker patents, then we would have to internally in the United States compete more fiercely, which would in turn make us more competitive globally because of all of the uh, training we undergo here in our domestic market. Um, we do talk about I'm interested in uh, is other options rather than just weakening patents overall. Could we do technology specific things? Um, and we focus on 3D printing here and say, uh, could we just eliminate patents on 3D printable products? If 3D printing dramatically reduces its costs, maybe we could find a way to just eliminate patents on them as, uh, as a way to sort of take them out of the patent system and then the patent system will fit what's left in there. Uh, one thing we point to is uh, mine and Tim Holbrook's work on digital patent infringement, this idea of what do we do with the CAD files that are floating around out there? They don't directly infringe patent claims to physical devices. So if we just continue that problem and don't let people claim to the CAD file, then you've really weakened uh, 3D printing pat or 3D printable product patents because if I can't control the CAD files, I'm sort of like the music industry with Napster out there. Um, we could, yeah, we're out of time here. Uh, 
um, protecting the rear is... The other thing I think is showing is this sort of goes along with uh, what I think the Supreme Court's doing with Alice and, and, and the 101 area, is they just, they've sort of decided that the patent system's not needed there. They believe uh, some of the uh, incentive story that says the, the why they're on the far end of Harry's slide there. And so they've used 101 as the instrument to say, oh, these things are not patentable. And maybe you could do something similar with the ad file claims themselves or with a really broad reading of Alice, a, a, any claim to a 3D printable item. You can actually see this in the Court of Federal Claims, a recent case that was on the Pat Mayo blog, uh, where it was all, all the claim was to physical stuff, a sensor that had a motion detection in it, and another sensor that had, and the uh, Court of Federal Claims said that was un, not patentable subject matter in light of Alice, it was an abstract idea. And yet every single claim element was something tangible. I don't think this is necessarily a good way to do it, but it is a way to do it. Out of time, so I'll stop there and welcome any questions or feedback. Dave, I saw your hand first. I really think this is interesting in the front project. I, I imagine some people are going to really want to take on whether, on the whole, uh, you know, it's getting enough cheaper and easier to patent or not. And so I think it'd be interesting to, you know, sure there's a trips problem and a congressional problem, but um, I think there's always been a case for. Uh, subject matter or industry specific, you know, segregation and differentiating in patents and, and this could be belong to the literature that really kind of starts to lay that out more and then you know, policymakers have to do with it what they will. Uh, so I would encourage you to go that way. I think that would be great and will avoid some of the headaches you're going to have where people are going to say, what about this, what about this, what about that. The other thing I think would be helpful is um, if you uh, grapple with the, and if it's going to be a book, this is perfect. It could be like Graham was saying this morning, you know, back to the 140 page articles that he apparently used to write. Um, uh, grapple with commercialization theory more. You do it a little bit in the paper right now, yeah. but uh, some, you know, that's really, I'm not sure that that's getting cheaper and easier or more difficult. Even with the proliferation of all the internet uh, ability, there's also all the crowding and noise out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Larry, I mean, yeah. Um, so I wanted to sort of challenge this. You seem to be making the assumption that innovation is up to sort of static, right? So um, because as innovation is easier, the types of things you can do also become more complex. So if you don't engage with that, I guess I'm just not convinced that the end product is necessarily cheaper, right? So in the past, for example, for DNA, yeah, you could have a PhD thesis that which is synthesizing DNA, but now that you can do it, it allows you to do a lot, stuff that's a lot more complex, right? So I, I would just say that, you know, the same with my, microprocessors, right? Yeah, you couldn't have an iPhone, uh, you know, 20 years. So that, that would allow you to make innovation a lot more complex. And so is that cheaper? It's a very good point. Jason raised that same question. I presented this, I don't remember when. Um, and we do try to address that a little bit, which is, is there something different about, let's say, 3D printing technology than a lot of technologies that come before? Some technologies open up tremendously big, huge avenues of innovation that are very expensive, and others maybe uh, open up new avenues of innovation that are cheaper uh, to exploit and to, to remain in. And so we talk about that very little, but it's a very interesting question that deserves more treatment. John? I guess I wanted to ask whether this is a paper about 3D printing in particular, or about all technological development in general. Like, and, you know, at IPSC in 1440, somebody gave the same paper about the printing press, and in 1947, they gave the same paper about the transistor. So, I mean, do you think that there's something distinctive about 3D printing, or is the argument that we should be decreasing, slowly but surely decreasing, the strength of patents over time, maybe consistent with Moore's Law or something like that? Do you think there's something sort of disjunctive about what's going on now? Yeah, I think that's related to that question, and again, we, we, we probably don't, that's not the focus of our paper, but it's a, it's a very good question and criticism of, of a, a hole in it, and maybe we can plug it more and go over the 25,000 word limit. Um, uh, I do think there's something to be said for there may be something a little bit different, but in one sense, yes, there's lots of examples of technology that have lowered the costs of innovation, and so maybe that just bolsters our argument that say, well, see, this has been slowly happening, and now it's just accelerating. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's then it's less a paper about three D printing and more a paper about graphic innovation, and then you have to do something to say, you know, actually, innovation really has become cheaper over time, as opposed to being sort of static. Right. I saw Mark's hand. Um, so 
on the 3D printing piece, um, one policy lever you might think about that I didn't see you talk about is the mere fact of infringement, uh, right? So we could try to re we, we could try to sort of restructure the patent law for the different characteristics of 3D printing, but it may be that 3D printing is taking care of itself in the same way that the internet took care of itself, right? By making it easier and easier for small infringing uses to just go undetected or unremedied. Um, and, we, and if that's right, then we only need to worry about the circumstances where folks like um, uh, hosts of, of uh, data files are going to be sued for uh, for indirect liability, right. but you could solve right. that problem a lot more easily than trying to recalibrate the patent system right. Right. Uh, to... That's the, 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 the digital uh, patent infringement, but if you can claim to the CAD file itself in your patent claims, then uh, just simply posting the CAD file anywhere, making the CAD file would be an act of infringement. So yeah, yeah, right. So you want, to, and you want to protect the intermediary, right? But you, but I don't know that you actually actually have to protect each and every individual end user for the simple reason that nobody's going to bother to sue them. Right, right, right. right. So I'm just just wondering if you uh, consider just weakening remedies as the mechanism for weakening patents. So, for example, taking into account like development costs when assigning damages. So this. One advantage this might have is that you know you wouldn't be paying with such a broad brush by assuming that costs are lower in all you know technologies. You can sort of tailor that question to to the dispute. Yeah, we uh, we had remedies. We took it out, but that's a fair point to, to reconsider bringing it back in. Well, so picking up on, on Eric's point, um, I think it's I think it's a good point in part because you want to make sure that the patents that you begin are the patents for which development has been cheapened. Right. You wouldn't want to somehow get the mismatch, and sometimes the ones that, because uh, you mentioned, for example, weakening patents regarding 3D, print, 3D printable devices, and I don't know that, that it is the 3D printable devices that are making, that are the ones that are making cheaper to develop through 3D printing. Right? It might be the 3D printable devices make it easier to develop this other category of technology. Right. Right. And remedies might, uh, considering development costs might be a way of keeping those more closely uh, linked. Just follow this next on. <laughs> so, so uh, to, to Laura and uh, John's question, which I think is a fundamental one for your paper, you might consider the, the economic literature on general purpose technologies, because there is a theoretical basis for distinguishing things like software and nanotechnology and 3D printing from other things. In the law, we talk about that mostly as research tools in context of research tools. But there's a lot of economic literature on how to, to characterize them empirically. And that can 